Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about um, wave function, which is the function in Schrodinger equation. We talked about free particle Schrodinger equation and this guy here would be the wave function. So the solutions to Schrodinger equation gives us the wave function for a particular particle. Uh, electron, proton, <coughs> or um, it could be any particle we are interested in. Um, it could be a solution for uh, molecules in a solid. Uh, we'll see later on. Um, we talked about how it is very similar to a classical wave function as we study earlier in our um, courses and solution to it will be generally a sinusoidal function. Uh, so as we find this wave function uh, solution, unlike mechanical waves in a string or sound waves in the air, it tells us where the particle could be at any moment in time and any space. And how it works is we take square of that wave function, that's probability density, uh, and if we have a um, complex wave function, the square is complex conjugate times the wave function. And as we look for where the particle might be, we integrate that probability. Uh, for a free particle, we discussed that there could be infinite number of solutions, and we add those solutions to find this total solution, which gives us a wave packet. And one interpretation of that we discussed was the, the particle wave thing that we don't really understand is doing showing this behavior overall, and when we measure it, it's somewhere along this wavy behavior. That's called Born Interpretation. And the other interpretation we, we know is called Copenhagen Interpretation, which is what is commonly accepted today. Uh, what better agrees with the experiments is that the particle is everywhere here. It's not really, it doesn't really have a definite, def definite position. If we are not looking and if we look, we collapse it to the position we measure it. So measurements change the particle's behavior. We talked about how we can define the amplitude and wave function and how is if amplitude is a narrow wave function is wider and if amplitude is wider wave function becomes narrower. Um, and here as you see Born's picture, Born interpretation as we talked about, particle is somewhere along this wavy behavior. Um, and this is Copenhagen interpretation. Particle is everywhere smudged picture. This would be representing the first energy level of an electron in a hydrogen atom. This is when we're not measuring. If we measure, we collapse it to a certain position. And the Schrodinger was mocking this idea, which is where the idea of Schrodinger cat is coming from. Uh, he was saying if we put a cat in a box, it can't, he, it can't escape. There is poison and, and a hammer tied to a switch that will turn on if a radioactive substance emits radiation, which is totally random. And if we are not looking, the cat is either alive or dead because either the radiation is emitted and the hammer knock on the poison, cat, cat is poisoned or not, uh, and he was marking that if, if we agreed with the Copenhagen interpretation and we are not looking at cat as both dead and alive. However, for particles, small particles, it's, it's shown by experiments that they are, they would be both dead and alive. So there are many, many Schrodinger cats jokes coming from this idea. Again, nowadays, the most common accepted idea is Copenhagen interpretation, and experiments agree with that most. We looked at free particles before. What if we have bound particles and this equation? This question here is describing if we have a particle that goes in between 0 to, uh, zero to L along this line, 
along a constant function. What is the probability of finding it on the left side of the box? Assume this is a particle in a box that goes right and left. <coughs> Imagine one dimensional here. We're only looking at what happens along x. Of course, this could be done three dimensional as well. But we're looking at one dimensional cases for now. <coughs> What we can do is we can find the finest wave function, which will be a constant c here. Uh, so the wave function will be equal to c, simply. Psi x c we always define as a wave function. So it's defined over here. And if we take square of that one wave function and integrate it from 0 to L over 2, half here, to the half point here, we will have probability of finding that particle in the left half of the box. This integration here. To be able to find this probability, I need the value of c. And to find the value of c, what we generally use is normalization situation. Uh, normalization is simply the probability of finding the particle anywhere. <coughs> B here is the probability. If I look at in space is minus to plus infinity, would I find, what is the probability of that I will find my particle anywhere, which is 100%, so that's equal to 1. Using this idea, we will always derive a definition for C, which will be here. Uh, from this um, integral, which will be square root of 1 over L. And then we will integrate for probability density, which is again psi x t squared 0 to L over 2. It ends up being a simple integration, and we have 1 over 2. We already know it will be 50% for this simple case, but we solve it mathematically. This one says this time we confine the particle into a line, but now it's mostly found in the center. So the best function to represent it would be looking like this in this blue line here, which will be defined as a cosine function. So psi could be defined now a cosine kx minus omega t. We look at it at t0, we freeze the time, it will be cosine kx. What is the probability of finding this particle in a region can also be found using the probability density. I'm going to call it for simplicity, probability density, which is psi x t squared. Again, if my function is imaginary, I say uh, psi x t times this complex conjugate. This is if my function is real. And we have a real function here. And what we do is the same approach. We're going to integrate to find the probability density. This one is uh, and probability, sorry is asking us what is the probability of finding the ball in the last one quarter of the tube. So we are looking at this part over here. What is the probability of finding the particle here? That will be from L over 4 to L over 2 with this definition. And we're going to go do the same. We're going to find information about the functions. It, will have, it has an amplitude, what we call. Um, it's a, it has a K number, wave number. And we will solve for those, and then we will integrate. To find the information about the wave number K, um, we can use boundary conditions. What is the cosine function here, or there, or there? turns out it's easier to find when it's z equals to 0 at a point, and at L equal to 2, this cosine is 0. Right over here, the function is 0. So usually either to get information using the 0 uh, boundary conditions for 0 points, um, to keep that in mind. So at L is equal to, uh, x is equal to L over 2, a cosine kx will be kl over 2 equals to 0, and we solve for k here. Um, what does that mean? Cosine kl over 2 equal to 0 means we know cosine pi over 2 is equal to 0, or cosine 
2 pi over 2 is equal to 0, and so on. So we can say then k times L over 2 is equal to an integer multiple of n pi over 2. So we can define as n pi over 2, n being 1, 2, 3, and so on. We can assume we are looking at the first energy level. This will be our principal quantum number. Later on, we will see it will define energy levels for a confined particle. And we can define for the first level, first value will be pi over L, and we can work for that. If we leave N as N, we could also work out that, but this way it will make it easier. Now, what is the probability of finding particle in this part here again, in this last quarter? We'll take square of our function and integrate, right? Square of our function again is probability density. And probability is the probability density integrated from L over 2, L over 4, sorry, to L over 2. This would be 4 over here. Okay, let me rewrite that. L over 4. First, we will need to find information about the constant A. Again, we use the normalization condition to find. So plus, minus to plus infinity, probability of finding particles somewhere is 1, 100%. Solve for A. We'll get a, a little bit more complicated function here, cosine squared kx. We can use this definition, double angle formula, to solve for it. Then we will have a squared cosine 2kx plus 1 over 2dx. And cosine is the derivative of sine. So when we walk back from integral to derivative, it will be sine 2kx. From the interior derivative becomes 1 over 2k. This is again if I have sine 2kx. And I want to der take derivative of it with respect to x. That's equal to the derivative of interior with respect to x, which is 2k times the derivative of the sine, which is cosine. So it will be 2k cosine 2kx. And <clears throat> what I have here is cosine 2kx only. So to make this the same, that should be then derivative of 1 over 2k times sine. And that 1 over 2k will cancel that, and I'll have cosine 2kx. So then I say it should be derivative of this whole thing. As I walk from integral to derivative, I put it in here. Integrate, <coughs> as I integrate for, <coughs> excuse me, minus to plus infinity, <coughs> it's, um, my function is only defined minus L over 2 to L over 2. All the rest is 0, so I can just simplify this down to minus L over 2 to L over 2. Minus infinity to minus L over 2, my function is 0, integral is 0, and the same as after L over 2. So we'll solve for A from here, and it will be a simple value, 2 over L. We will see this a lot, because the definition of a wave function will be quite often, a cosine function, and so on. Now we have definition of our a and k, we can put them in our cosine k, a cosine kx will be square root of 2 over l cosine pi over lx. Okay, um, this will be the full definition of our function. And now we can solve for the um, probability. l over 4 to l, l over 2, again this last section here. When I look at any moment in time, we assume that time is equal to zero, where would I find my particle? Uh, what is the probability of finding my particle at this section? Sorry. We integrate. Uh, we will have a similar cosine. We take square, cosine square. We'll write it out. This time, the sine function we will get from it will not go to zero because we have limits, different limits. And when we put in all the numbers, we'll end up getting these, which will be 0.09, 9%. So if I look at any time, the probability of my particle being here is, is 9%. If I look for a here, it would be 
this region, for example, it would be a lot higher because this graph already gives me a lot of information. So summarizing again, um, probability density is psi xt squared over psi xt times psi star xt. This is the function, wave function. And it's complex conjugate. And this is a complex conjugate. If it's a complex. If it's a real function, it's similar. Simple square of the function. Um, this would be an example of a complex wave function. For example, uh, A is the amplitude, which would be the distance from the center line if I draw my wave function with respect to x. Amplitude is the maximum position, distance away from the center line. Um, K is the wave number. Again, how many wavelengths fits in certain uh, unit distance, let's say one meter one centimeter. So you count the wavelengths within, assume this is the unit distance, uh, wave number would be two. Um, this figure here is nicely showing what's happening with the waves. So if I imagine this is a plot of the position versus time, I would measure the period of the wave if I measure distance between the peaks or troughs or distance between the beginning and end of a wave. If this was the time axis. It could also be the space axis. Um, let me make any one here. So I can plot the position of a particle versus time or versus space. Um, Let's call this y up and down and x. If I am plotting it versus uh, space, I'm going to find something like that. A uh, very ugly drawing, but you guys get it. And if I draw versus time, I will also get something like that. So this is telling me my particle is also in up and down. And I'm looking at it along the space, how does it look? And my particles oscillating up and down, I'm looking at it on time. As the time passes, how does it look? They look the same. Um, but this gives me information for time related, um, related properties of the wave. This gives me information for space-related properties of the wave. So if I measure, again, I like one full wavelength version of definition, so I'm going to go for that. The one full wavelength is that over here. So one trough, one crest. Let me go over it more so we can see it. That's one full wavelength. I measure that if I am measuring this distance, let me use a different color here. If I measure this distance is equal to wavelength, lambda. So, if I have a, a position um, versus, well, Oscillation, let's say, versus distance, and I look at how many wavelengths in unit distance, that's wave number. Assume again this is one unit distance. If I assume this is one unit distance, and I look at how many waves fits in there, one, two, two and a half number of waves in this unit distance is equal to wave number. 
which is also defined as 2 pi over lambda. If I look at the time versus the oscillation position, up and down oscillation of the particle, and I look at, this is still one wave. Let me pick another color here. This is still one wave, one trough, one crest. And if I measure this distance over there, from beginning to the end of that wave, I measure the period of that wave. That's period. What is a period if you folks forgotten? It's how much time it takes for one full wave to form. Which makes sense, right? If I look at this picture, this is the time it takes for my wave to form. And it, form, it forms again and again and so on. That's a period. And if I assume this is unit time, which is we generally take as seconds. So assuming, let's say, this whole thing is one unit time, one second. Then I count how many waves in that unit time. And then the number of waves equals the frequency. Number of waves per unit time. So how many? One, two, two and a half again. Okay, great. That's the frequency. This is what, what is shown in this picture. Simply it says this is y axis. Let me draw it oscillations of particles up and down and the horizontal axis could be time or could be space if it's space uh, what do I say um, if I have more waves in certain I assume this is unit distance again or unit time altogether let me actually draw two lines here um, they are shown, but maybe it will be more clear. So let's make the screen line the space line. If it's a space line, the number of wavelength defines the wave number. We have short wavelength. If you look at here, if I have short wavelengths, more waves will fit in here. So I'll have high wave number. And wavelengths and wave number are opposite, right? Inversely proportional. Let me put that here as well. Because k is equal to 2 pi over lambda. Uh, if I think that as time axis, I, I could also be time axis. Let me make a straight line here. So if it was a time axis, then the number of waves number of waves would be frequency right time if this was a time axis and this was a unit time the short period is distance for the time for one full wave right or distance between the time between two peaks or two crests two troughs are same same thing so time f it takes for one full wave to form is period how many waves fits is frequency it's just short period high frequency because period is is short here very short distance between the peaks or very short time for one wave to fall then uh, one, one wave to be formed then frequency is high and you can check back up in here as the wavelength increases if I think in terms of time period increases, frequency decreases, then less wave fits in unit time, and so on. And we can also think in terms of the distance, if the wavelength increases, the number of waves that fits in certain unit distance decreases. So we have high wavelength, small wave number.
Okay, this should be too high. Oh, lambda. All right, hope this was helpful. Probability density and probability is summarized in here. We can do a calculation for this form of wave function. For example, wave function time is complex conjugate uh, times the distance if the wave function is varying slowly or we integrate. It's a similar idea here. And if we do the complex conjugate multiplications, we'll get v squared from here. We have another important information or set of information we can get from known wave function definition is called expectation values. Expectation values are defined as if we look at a certain particle, number of particles that share the same wave function, um, what are their average position? in any moment in time. On average, where are they in general? Or on average, what is their energy? This is what is called expectation value. Uh, better definition here. The expectation value describes the average value of position for a large number of particles. For example, if I'm looking at expectation value for position, it could be energy, it could be momentum, and so on. How do we solve for expectation value? We have a definition. Expectation value, if, if, if it was any value, Q, and we're looking for its expectation value, it's again the average value of particles that have this wave function. Um, this could be again position, energy, momentum. We have the complex conjugate of wave function times what we call an operator, this hat is for operator, times the wave function, then we integrate that from minus to plus infinity with space. Now what changes here is the operator will be different for each definition, which are listed here. It, this is if I have a complex function, this is if I have a real function, it will be function itself, times the operator then function itself. This sequence is important because the operator is not a simple constant number always. It's sometimes an application uh, that applies the second function. So we have to go in order. For example, if I'm looking at expectation value for x, its operator is x, that's fine, I can put the x here or there, but if I'm looking for expectation value for momentum operator, it has a derivative. So if this derivative here, I have to put it in this place because this derivative will apply to the function, not the complex conjugate, for example. So we have to be careful about this ordering. Uh, it can be switched if we are not sh we are sure what we are doing, but we are not going to switch them to make sure we are not going to make terrible mistakes. Um, kinetic energy operator is also a derivative, so we don't want to move its position. And same for total energy. And that's what it is. Simply, it's math we are going to do here. Um, as we calculate uh, integrals, um, one thing, one mathematical thing to keep in mind is even and odd functions. Honestly, I always forget to check this and I'll calculate, finish my calculation, say oh, the result is zero, then I, I noticed and I, I could use this shortage, a uh, short approach. Um, so I'm gonna tell it to you if you can notice, often students notice better than me. I solve and solve and solve and find that, oh, it was even an odd function multiplication, the result will be zero. Um, but if you can see it before you go into solution, that's really helpful. You don't have to spend all that time. So what is this even an odd function? Um, an odd function is defined as here, if I replace the x value in my odd function, we are, we are talking about wave function, so assume our wave function is defined as psi x. Uh, we're looking at only space dependence. And if I replace x by minus x, the function inverses, the sign of the function inverses. That's an odd function. If I look at here, um, an odd function would have, if I have 
if I go to minus x axis, the odd function would change its direction totally. I will have negative values if it was positive here, or vice versa. And an even function is not like that. If I replace x by minus x, function is still the same. So if I have uh, an even function, this blue one over here, that varies as this on the positive x side, if I go to negative x side, it also varies the same. So even function is symmetric about the y-axis, and odd function is not symmetric. If even function times even function produces an even function, these two functions are even, multiply them, you, you get an even function. Odd function times odd function produces an even function. And odd function times even function produces an odd function. Uh, how do I use this to shorten my calculations? Is if I have an odd function and I'm integrating minus to plus infinity, that means I'm finding this area, right? And that area. And they cancel each other. So I'm going to get zero. So if I can notice that I'm integrate in minus to plus infinity odd function that will be zero if I can notice this before I go ahead take all the trouble to do the calculations it will be useful for example this function here the normalized wave function of a particle is that find the expectation value of position it will be x Say so x t squared dx. Notice here we use we change the position. Although I said we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be changing it to be to be on the safe side. It's always possible for x because it's just x. So it should be psi x t x operator, which is x, and psi x t again dx. So it's equivalent to that. And if we put this function here, we will see that it will be an even odd function multiplication, and we will have, when we take the square of this, okay, it will be even function, odd, odd function multiplication, so we will have an odd function overall, because odd times even is odd. So integration minus to plus infinity is zero. We don't have to go and take that trouble. Let's look at this example now. The time-dependent wave function of a particle confined in a region between zero to L and psi x t is equal to a e to i omega t sine pi x over L where omega is angular frequency is the energy of the particle, calculate the expectation values of position, momentum, and kinetic energy. It has an amplitude here we don't know, so first we start with calculating that, which is often called normalization constant because we use the normalization to calculate it. Let me remind you again, probability of finding particle anywhere. I'm going to call this probability all, all space, sometimes it's called as minus to plus infinity psi x t squared dx. Or if I have a complex function, it's the complex conjugate of that function times the function dx, which is what we did here. Then we input our function. If I have a complex function, complexity comes from here. If I have plus i omega t, the complex conjugate will be minus i omega t or vice versa. So that's all. And if we look at here, these two things, e to i omega t times e to minus i omega t becomes e to zero, which is one. And then we have this thing left. Now sine squared pi x over l or sine squared n pi x over l will come up 
as, a, as, a, as an integral. Normally, we do integration by parts to solve these. Um, we should apply it twice here. But our nice book, Harris book, is given us that as a solution. So if I have sine squared n pi x over l dx, I can just go ahead and say the result of that is this. You can always check this from the book. <coughs> In our case, n would be 1, right? We have pi x over l. So applying that, we can solve for a. We'll have a squared l over 2 is equal to 1. This thing will go to 0. And we'll have this. I told you we'll see this quite often, right? So a is equal to square root of 2 over l. We can replace that back and find the expectation values. What I did here is keep A until the end, so it will be a bit tidier. We'll have some solutions, some large equations like that. So, so let's see. Find the expectation value of X. Again, this is on average, if I look at any moment in time, there I would find many particles that are sharing the same psi function as their wave function, where I would find them on average. That's what expectation value of x is. It will be complex conjugate times x times the function dx minus the plus infinity. But my function is defined from 0 to L again, so all the rest will be 0. It's like a function. I'm making this function up. It's a sinusoidal function, so we can assume it looks like 0, 0 everywhere. And somewhere I'm seeing some function. And then 0 again. And the function is only defined in this 0 to L. Everywhere else, this goes to minus infinity. This goes to plus infinity. It's 0, so I'm just jumping down here. I could say integral minus infinity to 0, 0 dx, right? And L to infinity, same. It's just 0. So we just jump from here to there. Don't get confused over here to there. It's because the function is 0 everywhere else. We put these in. And then we put in the function. Complex conjugate only again with this plus version. The rest is the same. Times x. And the function itself, e to i omega minus i omega t version sine, and then again dx. It simplifies to this here. We have sine squared, and again, the definition of sine squared is from the book. But this time, we have x sine squared pi x over l dx. This would also be solved with uh, integration by parts. And here is the solution given from the book again. If you check the first page, you will see these. So we'll just go ahead and use these definitions. Take some time to get to here, but we can we can prove it if we want to. All right, if we put all these in here, again our n is equal to one. We'll have these a x squared over four zero to l. Lx over 4 pi, I'm replacing n by 1 here, sine 2 pi, x over L, 0 to L, minus L squared, 8 pi squared, cosine 2 pi, x over L. That should also be 0 to L. Uh, make sure you work these out and show yourself that some of these goes to 0. And we will have, well, this should be equal to 1. Um, goes to 0, it's easy to see, I replace x by 0, sine 0, 0, I replace x by L, L's go away, sine 2 by 0, the same thing here. And we solve for A. Guess what, square root of 2 over L. And, <coughs> wait, sorry, we, <coughs> sorry, I'm sorry, we, we we're not solving for L. Go back. We're not solving for L here. I don't know why it got lost. We are looking for X average. And X average is equal to that. Now we're going to insert L in here, A in here. 
a is equal to square root of 2 over L. a squared is equal to 2 over L. Insert in here and get x. It will be L over 2. So if I look at any moment in time, the most probable position, I'm going to find x, is here. That means my function should be overall increasing towards there. Kind of draw it, draw it good. Not perfect, but most probably it's in L over T. Hmm. This was a random draw. Looked out good. Okay, expectation value for momentum. Very similar idea. Here there is a difference. We will be applying an operator. It's not a simple multiplication here. We will apply this operator to that guy. We will take derivative of it. Um, IH is just the I um, complex square of minus 1, right, complex number. And H bar is H bar. So let's put our psi function a e to minus i omega t sine pi x over l, right? When I apply this operator, I'm going to take derivative of it. That's it. It's not that bad. d over dx psi. Notice I'm dropping psi xt here for simplicity, but it's psi xt still. It means x and t dependent. A is a constant. I'm not taking derivative with respect to time, so e to i omega t behaves as a constant with respect to space. I'm taking derivative with respect to x, so I'm going to worry about this part only. It's sine x will be cosine, and I'm going to take the derivative of interior first in terms of x, which will be pi over l. So it will be pi over l cosine pi x over l. And that's what I'm going to enter here for all this part. Right? Um, once, I, I, once I do that, then work it out. Let's see what we have here. We apply it. We'll have all this. This thing, this derivative is inputted here, right? And we have i h, h bar staying there. This is h bar, not really clear. Over 2L. And the rest is staying the same. I'm checking where is the 2L coming from. Oh, we replaced H bar by H. Okay. Never mind. Let me delete that. This is actually H. But from here to there, we replaced h bar by h. That's why we have 2l here. And pi has canceled. So here's what we have. We are going to do integration. We're going to end up getting this guy again. Guess what? We're going to use the definition from the book. And we will find that this will come out as zero. So momentum, average momentum will be zero. We'll see this quite often because um, for a particle trapped in between two points, let's simplify it. Let's say it's just simple, zero to L, and particle is trapped in there doing this. 
which is kind of what the current function looks like, right? There are details, but overall we found that we will mainly find the particles in the center here, in the middle, at L over 2. That's X average, but if you think in terms of what they are doing, they are doing this, right? Uh, let's say we have a lot of particles, some of them are going to right, some of them are going to right left, so we have uh, the low cities, a lot of particles going this direction, and some of them are going this direction on average. We have a big chance of getting two particles, one is going in this direction, one is going in that direction, same speed, same mass, so momentums cancels, average momentums cancels each other. You can also imagine one particle doing that, on average, it will have zero momentum because an equal amount of times it's going to the right and left with the same speed and it will, it will be on average zero momentum. If we have more than one particle, that even approximates to zero better. Um, I'm going to leave this part up to you folks. It's expectation value 4K. I'm going to post this, of course. This uh, solution will be there. But work it out yourself. Uh, how do we find expectation value for kinetic energy? Uh, here is the kinetic energy operator. Let's discuss this a little bit. Let me try to write that better. Remember operators with hat. It's minus h bar squared over 2m d squared x over dx squared. You will apply this to psi x, t function. You will take derivative twice. That's the difference from momentum. And we have a different constant, which is not a big deal. At some step, you will get to sine squared pi x over l. Use the definition again. Define, define, define. You'll find a solution. At the very end, we have a uh, Make sure you find this yourself and convince yourself this is correct. But until you get to the very end, I would suggest to keep h bar until the end and then replace by um, h is equal to h bar over 2. Uh, so h bar is equal to h over 2 pi to find this. So for this particle, what we found is we mainly find it in the center, L over 2. So it's function something like that, sinusoidal function, right? Um, we have, it has overall many particles shared in the same uh, wave function has zero momentum on average and the kinetic energy h squared over 8 ml squared i want to remind you again about correspondence principle um, classically if we trap a particle in between two points and it's going doing that if we look at any moment in time probability of finding it Anywhere along the box is actually the same. Probability of finding it here is the same as probability of finding it there, and so on and so forth. But quantum mechanically, it's most probably going to be in the center. And this seems, this shows that the, as if the classical mechanics don't agree with quantum mechanics. But going back to correspondence principle again, um, uh, the prediction of quantum mechanics and classical mechanics should agree. And let me draw a line here. Must agree for all microscopic systems. Must agree. So what's happening here? If we go to high enough, uh, over what we call and we will call in the future so quantum, pr uh, quantum principal quantum number, high enough energy levels, high enough, we mean 
n is equal to 20. Um, this function will start looking like that. We will have many uh, wavelengths along the distance L. This is quantum mechanical. This wavy looking behavior and the straight line is classical mechanical and classical mechanic version. So if I look at any moment in time, probability of finding particle along this line is equal for classical mechanics, right? Anywhere I can find it at the same probability. And look what's happening here, quantum mechanics. When we increase the energy state, and I look at any moment in time, most probably I'm going to find a particle at any point along these stars. That's very high energy level, n is equal to 20. So the oscillations are allowed and they are collecting. And it's almost the same as classical mechanics. It's almost, I found it equally anywhere. But guess what? Classical mechanics level of energy levels are not 20. It's a lot higher than 20, 10 to the order of maybe 34. And imagine this 20 is 200. You will have a lot more squiggly line here. It's going to be like one straight line. And you can say, well, I can approximate that. If I look at any moment in time, probability of finding particle anywhere along this L is equal. Then we say, OK, it agrees with classical picture at energy levels that are very high and energy levels are very high in the classical picture. Alright, I'll let you go with that and see you in class.